Salaries who were ever going to have stocks and shares. So it's different. And I think um, you probably find the same. And, and even people that normally invest in new businesses probably are investing based on what the balance sheet looks like. So how many products are you selling? Uh, what's your growth projection? Um, what are we likely to to make in a very short term um, for our, from our investment? High tech businesses coming out of universities aren't like that. You have 10 years. And if you're happy to do that, then probably in 11 years, you may make 10 times what you invested but you've got to be really patient. So, so I think that, that probably sums up, so let's stop there. Yeah. Um, hi, Aurek from uh, Technology Licensing Office at the National Science and Technology Development Agency. We are under the Ministry of Science and Technology. So um, I'm sure that uh, many of us uh, have learned from the uh, three excellent speakers this morning that you are so well established compared to many of us in this room who are like five or ten years experience, right? And um, have you heard of uh, the story you just mentioned? Um, I'm just wondering if you yourself have been working with like smaller TLO in the like supervising or working with a smaller office and if they have, if they have challenges, uh, what would be their challenge in kind of driving the financing for the universities if you understand it? So, so absolutely, we are more than happy to, to come and help train um, new tech licensing offices and staff. We have groups from um, offices come over to Cambridge. Uh, we can either set up a course for uh, a week uh, or longer for you to understand what we do really at a nuts and bolts level. But it's important to do that in Cambridge. Uh, we will uh, run a program where anyone can come and learn what ha and how we do technology transfer. Um, and that course costs uh, around £2,000 per person. For a week. So you're in Cambridge a week. Uh, we teach you what Cambridge Enterprise does, we show you what some other parts of the university do, we show you around the ecosystem, um, all those sort of things. So, um, so the other part of the question really is, is what challenges do you face? And there are always challenges, um, but there are many people that you can ask about those challenges. If I think back, um, nearly 20 years to when I started in the office, 2001. So I started the uh, day before 9-11 uh, in 2001. So day two was a bit weird. <laughs> um, we had a very different system then. We had very different support from the university. A lot of the posts in the office were three-year short-term contracts similar to how you might employ a postdoc in a lab. Um, we had no patent budget at all. Uh, the office was small. I was the seventh employee. We're now 65. Uh, about how you treat research collaborations or sponsored research agreements as they call them. Um, and how you look after IP and, and why it is. Helping them to get translational research funding so they can move from uh, you know, blue sky academic research to something a little bit more uh, perhaps uh, other technologies and worldwide have started to coalesce and that 
gives you an opportunity to then commercialize that technology. But I think some of our big, um, big challenges in the early days were uh, how to convince academics that uh, we weren't going to get all, getting away really, because very often you find um, that someone will approach you and say, "I've got this paper coming out in Nature, let's say." Um, in a couple of weeks, necessary, we can file a patent in a couple of days. You know, if they're willing to put the energy in of sitting down and talking to a patent attorney, we can get something filed, we can get it protected. But we, I think it's something uh, Kathy said earlier this morning, was that until they've got an idea, doorstep, and saying, why aren't you moving fast enough? <laughs> um, and another of our big challenges is actually to keep the awareness of our office amongst the academic community really high. So we run uh, a survey every three years to understand 60% say they knew what we did. But actually, when you dug down into the answers and what they thought we did, they were confusing us with the research collaboration office, with the comms office, with you know everybody. So, actually, that a cartoon of a fisherman sat on the side of a river can, who is got one single line dipping in the water, and they're looking to hook the academic who's got an idea. And that's what it feels like. Um, any other? So I think the, the other, the other big um, piece is is really around education. We are trying to educate. Was the monotone um, antibody I spoke about? Um, Kanban that went off the patent list two years ago. So our royalty income, um, annual royalty income, has dropped by about six million pounds. And so we've had to go to the university and say, look, this year we're likely to run a loss. It's going to be a million pounds. Um, are you happy with that? You know? And actually, years we've been returning a surplus to them because uh, so, so we're entitled to part of the revenue share. We get 2.6 million in budget. Once we've met our operating costs, we return the surplus directly to the university. So we've been doing that for about the last five years, and we've returned over 10 million in the last five years. So they're, they're saying, yeah, fine. Um, one minute, we sold a company two weeks ago. Um, we're looking at 18 million income from that, that company sale. So instead of looking at a one million loss, we're probably looking at 17 million plus. You know, surplus. So that's going to that's going to be bad. But next year, we may run a loss. Um, so there's a there's a big educational piece there about telling everyone how the. I think the uh, evaluation of technology at an early stage to decide you know, what's going to be a money maker, what you can commercialise is. I guess that no one, you know, no one is capable of, of making. We can't, we can't do that. We... Yes, yeah, of course. So, so um, I think you know, Kathy went through it earlier today. There's there's a whole whole process there about um, you making sure that it obeys the laws of physics. So 18 years ago, we had, you know, every three or four weeks, we'd get someone walk through the door with saying, and saying, I've invented a perpetual motion engine. Now, obviously, those aren't going to work, so they get killed or spread. Um, but then you also get the, the, uh, the next stage um, is, well, we're not sure. And, and certainly, um, in Cambridge is, is it patentable? Have we got something we can protect? 
So we'll look into that, we'll do some due diligence, we'll talk to a patent attorney, and if they say yeah, it's patentable, of course they always say yes to that. Um, but okay, that, that, that's taken its rope. Can we then work with the academic? Um, some of our academics uh, uh, can be difficult, uh, special, let's say. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes it's just not always possible. And I think that, that was certainly more common in the early, early days, less so now. I think um, you know, the mindset has changed. Um, beyond that, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, what's the market now? What's the market in the future? Is there a market? Um, should we be investing to develop the technology and the proof of concept or helping them to write grants for translational funding, um, those sort of things. But actually, if we're getting to that stage, we're probably going to take a punt and say, so um, we run the, the consultancy service, as I was describing earlier. Um, so we have a team of around six people who run this consultancy service. They do around 400 contracts a year. It turns over about six million pounds. Um, we have a set of standard agreements which have been agreed by the internal lawyers within the university. We try to use those agreements as much as possible. Um, and in fact, uh, they're used more, or more than 75% of them. Uh, consultancy transactions. Um, and we try to provide a very good service in which uh, we uh, support our academics as much as possible and really take the pain away from them. Um, in doing that, we charge a 12.5% management fee, which covers the cost of the office. Um, and I think for for us, we've seen a huge turnaround in the customer experience for our academics over the last 10 years. Uh, when I arrived to lead that office 10 years ago, um, contracts took, took much longer to be put in place. Um, but since then, we have increased the number of staff in the office. We have a standard agreement that we'd like to use, as I say, we use it more than 75% of the time. 85% of our agreements are put in place in less than 30 days. Um, and probably 55% in less than 14 days. Um, and I don't think you could outsource that to another organization and get the same level of customer service that we can provide. And also, it would be difficult for the university, and the university's lawyers in particular, to trust an external organisation over whom they've got no power and no control to deliver that level of service and protect the university to the level that we protect the university. So, for us, I think the only option is to bring it in house. Managing something outside, I think, would be, would be extremely difficult. Um, in Cambridge, the university views consultancy as being outside of the employment contract with the academic. So the academics are free to do as much consultancy as they like, and to do it um, completely on their own, if they want to, or to go out and get someone else to put them in place. But if they come through our office, obviously it's big, big benefits to the university, actually big benefits to them because um, we negotiate the contract, we've done, we're doing 400 a year, um, we can advise them on how much they should be charging for their time because we've probably seen something similar done by another member of faculty for some company in that sector solving the same problem probably within the last two years. So we can advise on the fees. 
Um, and also, they're, they're covered by the university's professional indemnity insurance if they come into our office. So there's lots of lots of big advantages for them. Obviously, the university gets the protection I described. Um, so, in, sh in short, I don't think you can do it outside. Um, in addition, we are starting to develop um, a better database, which will in time lead to an academic portal, which will allow the academics to see the data that we're holding on them. So within that, we will have a consultancy section, which will tell them how much money they earned in the last year, or however many years they've been doing the consultancy, who for, what the fee rate was, um, what they did, all of those sort of things that they can look back at that data. I think that will be certainly um, for tax purposes for them, that will be a very rich source of data because we pay all our academics um, as if they were self employed individuals. So once the money comes in from the client, we deduct our management fee, we tell the academic how much they we owe them, and they invoice us. So they have to make a tax return for income tax purposes once a year. And so having the data that they can refer to um, on our system uh, will be very helpful. has some system to allow the officer or academia to set up the company and we have uh, some system to uh, get some uh, benefit from those uh, academy. So if we take the situation of a spin-out company where uh, an academic has invented some technology and they also want to form a spin-out company to develop the technology. So in, the, in that case, uh, we're going to do two types of transaction. We're going to license the technology into the company. Um, that's going to be in a mixed form. Um, we're going to take uh, some equity for licensing the technology in. We're also going to take, uh, or, or going to want to negotiate, I should say, um, a royalty on product sales. In addition to those two, we're going to invest some money into the spin-out company through our seed fund, and for that we're going to want some equity. So we uh, have um, no regulations that restrict an academic only equity in the spin-out company, so that's perfectly available, and we're happy to do that. And what we will do, we will say, okay, pre-money, um, we're going to say that the academic founders are going to own half the business, and we're going to own half the business for licensing the intellectual property. But then, we're going to consider a number of things. We're going to consider, are the founders the only people who are named as inventors on the intellectual property? If they are, then we will probably say to them, if you waive your right to any part of the revenue share from when we sell our shares, company, then we will take less equity. So from the 50%, we're perhaps down to 30% because they've waived their rights. Then we're going to say, how big a contribution are the patents that we have filed and paid for in the intellectual property that's going into the company? Now it's usual that in addition to the uh, patents, there's a huge amount of know-how that the founders and inventors are going to put into the company. So we will say, okay, so perhaps 
um, our patents aren't all of the intellectual property. And so we will go down to say 20% of the equity. And so that's how that sort of negotiation works. Morning, you mentioned about the uh, ownership policy, and uh, you have some uh, faculty privilege to choose to own the IP earlier, and then the university will own only the patent. Can you revisit that issue again? Yes. So the IP policy at the university is such that the university owns registrable intellectual property only registered intellectual property. All the other intellectual property is owned by the faculty. And so, um, and, and that's because of the UK Patent Act 1977, which said the employer owns intellectual property created by its employee. So that's how the university ends up with that ownership. But the individual academics have the right to choose whether they want to commercialize or not. And if they want to commercialize, whether they use the services we provide or whether they go it alone. And if they go it alone, there was the bottom revenue share, which gave most to the academics, and then above fifty thousand pounds there was a seven and a half percent to the, the university and seven and a half percent to their research department. Or if they came through us, then there was the different tiered revenue share which ended up above £200,000, with a third going to the academics, a third to their research department, and a third to Cambridge Enterprise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So we pride ourselves in delivery such a good service that no one wants to opt out. The only people that opt out are people who perhaps have been working closely with a company um, and they know that they're going to license the intellectual property and that's only happened once to my knowledge and we still haven't seen anyone come back. like to know that in, in Cambridge, who made the decision of the, how the quality that the university would like to take or the uh, decision on technology licensing, who made the decision is enterprise or the lecturer or someone? And the second question is the equity in case of equity, is it diluted or is that can be diluted or it's like that? So the uh it's a university intellectual property policy. It's not ours. The university decided, the 5,152 members of the Regent House decided on the intellectual property policy. It took them 10 years to decide. It's their revenue share. We just don't like it. Um, and as far as the equity is concerned, it's all diluted. So, so when I was talking before about, you know, we would negotiate that pre-money we might be down to about 20% for a licensing in the technology, and then we would um, look to invest in the company, so at that point everyone's going to be diluted, um, because we're going to have three people in it, um, uh, so some of us as investors, us as uh, licensing in the technology and the founders, and then it's just going to get diluted. Oh, that's the end of Sorry, sorry, yeah. you need to go. Okay. Send me an email. I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. So, so thanks very much, uh, everyone, for coming to this second workshop. Um, hopefully, you gathered some useful information from my presentation this morning. 
Um, but uh, so the, the opportunity is now to, to answer questions. I was going to say that, uh, answer your questions, um, that uh, there will probably be more people coming in, um, but we'll, we'll start and get going. So um, anyone want to volunteer to ask the first question? Thank you. Um, yeah, let me give you that. I just wanted to, to ask a few questions around the, the Capital Innovation Fund. So, so um, I've been helping tech startups raise money for, for about 20 years. And um, uh, when it comes to universities and home equity, um, it's a little bit of equity is a good thing, but too much equity is, is a bad thing. It goes with corporations too at the early stages because then investors are like, you know, they're worried about, okay, is there a conflict of interest or is the risk tolerance the same and, and the, the hesitation? So the fact that you do uh, the seed fund in the early stage, where it's usually too much risk for the, the institutional guys to come in, it's a good thing. But what's interesting is when universities do that, 